Hey, and welcome back to my channel, or welcome if this is your first time watching. My name's John. I'm an American living in the northeastern part of the United States, and I'm trying to uh, do videos that are geared towards getting a better understanding beyond stereotypes and overgeneralizations of the children of the British Empire and their parent. By that I mean the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, at least to start. Um, I hope to have some fun. I hope to be able to laugh at ourselves and one another a little bit, but break through those stereotypes and get a better understanding of who we are and how we relate and how we're different. Because at the end of the day, I do truly think that we are all part of the same global family. Um, without further ado, I'm going to be doing the history of Canada explained in 10 minutes. 10 minutes is not a whole lot of time, but let's see what we can learn in that time. Canada, known for their delicious maple syrup and being home to nearly all of the greatest hockey players of all time, is the second largest nation on earth and with approximately two million lakes, contains over 50% of the freshwater lakes on the planet. 50% freshwater lakes on the planet. I hadn't, I did not know that. I, I live in the Northeast, my state, albeit it's a big state, and I live in the Southern part, borders Canada. Um, and I've been there a number of times. I had no idea about the lakes. I just, that's. For many uh, thousands of years, this region was populated with many indigenous tribes of hardy people capable of overcoming the severe here. and lengthy winters, thriving and developing unique cultures. The first non-native people to settle in Canada, and the New World in general that we know of for sure, were the Vikings. They built a settlement in mm -hmm. Newfoundland, around 1000 AD. It is unclear for exactly how long this settlement was occupied for, or if there was more, but ultimately, it was either abandoned, pillaged, or its inhabitants succumbed to disease, or assimilated into the local population, but theories abound. Nearly 500 years later, in 1497, the Italian explorer Giovanni Capotto was the first European to explore oh, North America's Cabot. coast, <laughs> claiming it for Italian. the English crown. So his name was Giovanni Shortly Caboto, after, John the Cabot. Spanish and the Portuguese would do the same, but remained uncolonized for several decades, with only a few seasonal Portuguese and Basque fishing outposts built, until the French arrived. Jacques Cartier claiming the land for France in 1534. He named the Gulf and River after St. Lawrence's Saint feast Lawrence. day on which he arrived. The French called the territory around the river Canada, after the native word for settlement. After several failed attempts at permanent settlement succumbed to starvation and disease. Okay, so I never knew where Canada got its name. The That's cities of Quebec and Port Royal were successfully established. By 1670, the English colonies in the south had expanded, and new settlements were established in Newfoundland Hudson and Bay. south of the Hudson Bay. The fur trade particularly in beaver company. pelts, became extremely lucrative as it became the favored material for hat makers and luxury winter clothing in northern Europe. This greatly encouraged further northern settlement by both English and French fur trappers seeking to make a fortune. The French and the English did not peacefully coexist, with the French temporarily taking much of the territory around the Hudson Bay during the lengthy period known as the Beaver Wars. Not only the Europeans became wealthy and influential from the trade in beaver pelts, the Iroquois Confederation of six powerful tribes, armed with European firearms, initially allied with Dutch merchants, and then the English, to aggressively attack the French, and most other Indian tribes in the region to obtain more furs. Many of these tribes banded together with the French to halt Iroquois expansion. Peace was negotiated after 72 years of fighting. See, if you study um, American history in any kind of detail, you do learn all of this because at this point in time you had there was no america there was no canada there was this continent of north america where the european powers were competing for um for land for resources for trade and um of course you had the indigenous populations there that had their own view of things and the iroquois confederation were very powerful their language was very influential and uh, forms the basis of uh, what a lot of the Native American languages are in the Northeast here. Um, but yeah, so we learn all of this. I, I know a lot of this because I study this in studying American history as a history major in college. I think where we're gonna diverge is the post 
separation of the United States after our revolution. And then Canada's history takes on its life of its own, and I can't wait to see what we've got. And many, there. mostly Indian lives lost. And little territorial change. The region of New France was comprised of several colonies, Canada and Louisiana. Yeah, as I said, look at this. This is Canada and Louisiana. This was French America. And this little section over here on the East Coast was British America, uh, with the exception of Florida down there, which was Spanish. Um, so this was very much in flux. What was going to be Canada, what was going to be the United States, was nowhere near determined the largest, yet. Along with the smaller Placence and Acadia which the British Empire obtained from the French in the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 in a complicated agreement concerning the War of Spanish Succession. The France also recognized the legitimacy uh, of the Hudson Bay Cajuns. Company's claim over Rupert's land. Interestingly, the Hudson Bay Company is still in existence today, primarily as owners of a retail store chain, bearing their name. Despite their larger territory... No way. I had no idea the Hudson Bay Company survived. That is crazy. Was it uninterrupted or did somebody just revive the name for a retail store? Does, if anyone knows from Canada, let me know in the comments. The French increasingly became outnumbered by the rapidly growing British colonies surrounding them. By a margin of 10 to 1 by the mm -hmm. time the next major conflict between the two occurred. During the Seven yeah. Years' War, or the French... Because look at this, the, the French held so much more territory, but they didn't settle. The, the, by and large, there were not a lot of French settlers, um, whereas the English settled in droves and outnumbered the French settlers by a huge amount in a Indian smaller War, area. As it has become known in much of North America, French-speaking Acadians were deported far from... And the French and Indian War was part of a global conflict, the Seven Years' War, that also took place in Europe among the major European powers. It really truly was the first The Canadian World Borderlands. War some of whom formed the basis of much of the Cajun population of modern-day Louisiana and New Orleans. Both English and French empires sent thousands of regular infantry to North America during the war, supported by local militias and Indian tribes. The great Right, but the difference is that the English had vast amounts more local militia because there were there were huge populations in the English territories where the Whereas the French had to rely on their Native American allies because they didn't have a lot of Italy outnumbered there. French, relied heavily on Indian allies, and fought the British to a standstill early in the I war. Did, until the British successfully watch, besieged the cities of Quebec and Montreal. Despite the French later defeating the British in a pitched battle, they failed to retake their capital city. In the treaty that ended the war soon after, France ceded Canada to Britain while giving Louisiana territory to her ally, Spain. It is important to note at this time, much of North America's non-coastal areas were still largely unpopulated, with many of the native tribes heavily depleted through warfare and invasive diseases from which they had little immunity. Diseases, with yeah. a population of approximately Smallpox. 3 million, the American colonies waged a successful rebellion. But the... Um... Louisiana territory, although it was ceded to Spain, was ultimately purchased back by Napoleon. And Napoleon then later sold it to the, er, the young United States, and that's how we acquired it. ...against the British crown. A little over a decade later, the Americans attempted and failed to take Quebec, which remained loyal to Great Britain. After the war, many British loyalists moved north into Canada. During the following War of 1812, both British and American armies launched several failed invasions of each other's territory, ending in military stalemate and the status quo was maintained. The treaties following the war established a more formalized border between the two nations. Despite the Canadians' desire not to join their American neighbors to the south, movements for self-rule increasingly grew among the Canadian lower and middle classes, culminating in the rebellions of... So that's interesting. You know, the War of 1812 is where my knowledge of Canadian history sort of ends. And, um, you know, that was the United States against Great Britain, technically, but a lot of Canadian soldiers fought for the British crown. Uh, it's a complicated issue, and it was born out of Napoleonic Wars, but Britain was doing things to hamper United States trade and impressed our sailors and things like that. But America sort of wanted the war too because they thought it was an opportunity to um, 
invade Canada and annex Canada because they wrongfully thought that the Canadians would uh, happily join us if given the opportunity, and they were sadly 1837 mistaken. and 38 that were severely dealt with and crushed, and saw the short-lived Republic of Canada established by William Lloyd Mackenzie. Despite the Republic's short-lived lifespan and diminutive size, widespread public support not only from many Canadians, both French and English-speaking, but also from Americans to the South, spurred Great Britain's government to make major concessions in the rebellion's aftermath. The Act of Union in 1840 united Upper and Lower Canada into the new province of Canada, and the granting of responsible government soon after allowed for a far greater degree of self-rule to be exercised by the elected representatives of the people. So I never knew that there was an armed rebellion and, the, and this little republic declared. I mean, obviously it was a small rebellion that didn't go anywhere, but uh, I just never knew that the Canadians in any form rebelled against their British ma masters. The other thing I've always been confused about, maybe can, somebody can explain this in the comments, is why was Upper Canada lower and Lower Canada was upper? In 1846, the disputed Oregon Territory was peaceably divided between Great Britain and the United States, pretty much by drawing a straight line and giving Vancouver Island to Canada. Throughout the 19th century, a massive boom in the logging industry fueled large waves of immigration to Canada, gradually replacing the fur trade as Canada's most lucrative industry. In 1867, the British North America Act or more commonly called the Constitution Act today, established Canada as a self-governing democracy with Ottawa as its capital city. To the west, the Hudson's Bay Company negotiated the sale of Rupert's Land to the newly formed Canadian government. The Métis people of mixed European, primarily French, and Indian ancestry were the largest population of the Winnipeg area of what is now Manitoba. Fearing the land they had held for generations would be seized by newcomers fear. from the east, they rose in rebellion creating a provisional government. And after a tense standoff, and a Want to learn about Canadian history? You know what Canada is? Can you hear? Eventual occupation by federal troops. Okay. Many of their demands were met, respecting their rights. The leader of the rebellion, Louis Riel, would lead another larger but less successful rebellion, 15 years later, that ended with his trial and execution. Louis Riel became a martyr or villain to many Canadians, his death increasing the tensions between Indian, Métis, English, and French groups in society. Because of the key rule, the partially complete... See, here, here again is another rebellion I... I the transcontinental heard. railway played in the suppression of the rebellion. Political support for completing it soared among... It's like, you. I would love to see one of those alternate history what-if scenarios, if any of those rebellions had survived. Um, what would Canada's relationship to Great Britain be? What would its relationship to the United States be? Um, would, would Canada and the United States have moved closer towards each other? It, it's just very interesting. And um, you see this railroad too, it is all along the border with the United States. So that reminds me of something I've heard, which is that 90% um, of the Canadian population lives within 100 miles of the United States border because of weather, but also because of fertile, fertile land. Um, is that true? Uh, let English me know English speaking the Canadians. And the railroad was completed in only four years from when it had begun. The 1890s saw the Klondike Gold Rush, in which over 100,000 prospectors set out to the remote Yukon region in hopes of striking it rich. Some did, but most didn't. After several decades of stagnant population growth, largely due to emigration to the United States, Canada's population sharply increased due to a good economy and high foreign immigration throughout the early 20th century. During the First World War, we Canada, still a dominion of the United Kingdom, sent 620,000 troops to fight in Europe. 67. The Gillette Labs with exfoliating bar, effortless shaving in one efficient stroke. Densify from Crest Pro Health. It actively rebuilds tooth density to extend the life of teeth. 1,000 would die, while another 173,000 would be wounded. The staggering casualty rate grieved and shocked the nation. The war had a strong impact on Canadian nationalism 
and the desire to self-govern its own international affairs, which they obtained when the British Parliament passed the Statute of Westminster in 1931, which acknowledged Canada's co-equal status with the United Kingdom. Between the World Wars, Canada was hit particularly so hard during the Great Depression of the early 1930s, with unemployment rates reaching 25%, and many men living in unemployment relief camps. During the Second World War, over 1.1 million Canadians served in that brutal conflict I think that's that a left nearly 100,000 of them dead or wounded. In 1949, Newfoundland became the last Canadian province to incorporate. In 1965, Canada adopted its current flag. Here's a selection of some of the other national flags that were proposed. Let me know. Um, this number five looks without the leaf, but I think there was something else. Looks like uh, a flag I saw flown in Toronto a lot, and I think maybe that was the Ontario flag. Let me know if I'm right about that. In the comments of which one do you think looks best? In 1982, the Canada Act passed the Parliament of the United best. Kingdom and was ratified by the Queen, granting Canada the right to create their own constitution, which they promptly did. Still recognizing the constitutional monarchy in a mostly ceremonial rule, the new con that, that That's crazy. They didn't get the... I, I mean, you know, they were essentially in Canada self-ruling and were co-equal with the United Kingdom but still didn't have their own constitution until 1982. I, I was born, I was a child. Um, that was during my lifetime. That's, that's, <laughs> that's really astounding. The constitution abolished the British Parliament's remnants of influence over Canada. Canada is now a nation of over 36 million people, where over 20% speak French as a first language and has the 10th largest economy in the world. The province of Quebec has maintained a strong French influence over the centuries, yeah. and has on two occasions voted in Great referendums place. to decide whether Quebec should proclaim national sovereignty and become an independent country. In 1995, it very nearly did not pass, with secession still being an issue till this day. This has been Epimetheus. Let but my understanding is that the, um, while the secession conversation is never gone it isn't uh as prevalent as it was in the 90s if you if there were to be a referendum today it probably would not ha be that close am i wrong about that um these are just things that i've read or heard but i don't know for sure well thank you for watching that was really fun um i learned a lot and that just the tip of the iceberg knew a lot prior to the war of 1812 uh, most of what i saw afterwards was news to me and I would really love to learn a lot more, but this was a good um, introduction into the history of Canada. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.